Hi, this is Dr. Gail, and I wanted you to know I have a whole bunch of other things to offer you. If you go to spunkyoldbroad.com, you will see an array of SOB stuff for sale and all our latest products and additions. If you're interested in getting on TV, I have a brand new course, Get on TV. And if you want to start your own business, you'll want my SOB Guide to Business Success. I know you'll love them all. I guarantee it. Welcome to the SOB Radio Show, where we have fun, interesting guests, and hot topics. Each week, we offer insights into music, fashion, health, fitness, and humor. Do you have the perfect guest for us to interview? I want to know. Drop me a line on our Facebook page at Spunky Old Broad 1, or reach out to me on our website at SpunkyOldBroad.com. And now, back to the show. This is Gail Carson, and I'm back with Christine Paracas. And as you have heard in our first part of our journey, Christine is uh, really uh, an adventurer in many areas of her life. Not only uh, has she been a lawyer and not only has she learned to pay the saxophone, but she's been on ski patrols and she, um, you know, she is now someone who talks about resiliency, especially after the age of 50. And uh, it was interesting, Christine, what you were talking about with your knees, because my knees are just horrible. And um, I am a dancer and I am an exerciser. And there are so many things I can't do now. And I should have had my knees done five years ago. And I went to see the doctor, which I did three times. I so disliked him that I just couldn't take him being an And he's great. He's a great doctor, but his bedside manner is zero. And so uh, he kept me waiting the last time for two and a half hours in the office. And I just said, that's it. So I, I get my, my knees and I do what I can with them, but I can't do Zumba and I can't do high impact and I can't do a lot of things. But, um, you know, going back to your entrepreneurial journey and uh, all the things that you've been through and all the things that you've experienced, um, what would you say are some pivotal moments that you had in your entrepreneurial journey? Well, you know, I wish I could say that I learned from all the exciting, successful experiences that I've had, but I've had debates with friends about this, and I truly think that we learn the most from our failures, right? And there's nothing that I haven't, that any business person experiences that I haven't experienced firsthand or through my clients, including, you know, loss of business, uh, partnerships that go awry. There's just things that happen to us if you're out there doing it enough, right? If you're living on the edge, if you're, if you're shifting positions, if you're trying different things. And so um, realizing that there's these experiences that are going to happen and what can I learn from them? you know, and then most importantly, and this was the big lesson of the storms was not going it alone, right? That we, we tend to suffer in silence. So we miss the learnings that we could get from these terrible experiences that happen or the the downfalls of every entrepreneur's life. And, um, we get whipped around and we then become a victim to it. And it isn't necessary. You know, we have a choice about these things at the moments that they're happening to gain the learnings that are there for us, right? Because otherwise, why would it be that? You know, the world is not a hostile place if you choose it not to be. And everything that happens, even if it feels pretty darn uncomfortable, can be an opportunity to learn. And I think that's what it's there for. But sometimes, you know, we have to be dragged, myself included, hand up, is, you know, kicking and screaming to that change. Yeah. You know, what do they always say? If you don't have a thousand failures, you know, you're not learning anything. And that most of the uh, CEOs in the world and the people who are are doing fantastic things and and, uh, are billionaires today included, uh, that they've failed many times and probably more times than they've uh, been successful. Although it was interesting, I listened to something yesterday about Warren Buffett And uh, he said something like, I'm not going to quote exactly, but something like uh, he turns down 99 things out of 100, but it's the one thing that he chooses that he focuses on that becomes successful. So um, that is another thing. I mean, we have so many temptations. I mean, we, especially entrepreneurs, we get sidetracked by shiny objects and boy, it's hard to get back to what what were we doing originally? So what are some of the obstacles that you encountered as an entrepreneur? Well, you know, I, I just was thinking about a, a mentor of mine talking about um, 
uh, multitasking with businesses, right? There's been times when I've been in charge of or navigating through multiple businesses. And I think that I have, I became less effective trying to do too much. So, you know, he was coming off of a conversation with a lot of very successful, we're talking, you know, nine figures and beyond people who, you know, were talking about their second business and saying second businesses eat the first business. You know, it takes us away if you're doing something that strays from what was your original vision. So losing sight of what we're doing and why we're doing it, first, not even knowing what those things are. How many times have you seen entrepreneurs and business people get started without knowing the answer to those fundamental questions and that keep us going when things get tough and not uh, abandoning those visions, you know, in favor of the shiny object. So staying with it or figuring out how to, you know, vertically integrate or do something that feeds the other uh, activities. And so, you know, I was thinking about one of my most successful entrepreneurial ventures and I've, you know, brought other many partners to seven figures and eight figure uh, businesses and individuals. And I'm talking profitability, right? And and so we took a company that was a competition go-karting company and developed a product line and retail services and a racing team. And, you know, we did things that were all in concert with and that fed the main business and was all part of the vision. And even my last company, which is a market research uh, company for the entertainment industry, we branched out into other um, revenue streams that served the main focus of the business. So as an entrepreneur, you don't want to be attracted to things that will sidetrack you from what you're doing, but will complement and serve what you're doing because you can build on success. It was funny. I was going just going to say when you said to compliment, because um, there's a, a mentor of mine who says very often when you start a second business, you said it will eat it. Well, it just grows bigger than the first business. It's something you didn't even think of when you started the first business, but it's a compliment to the business and it grows bigger than the original one. So there are just so many aspects that people can approach at this particular point. But what would be your advice then to avoid some of the challenges that you've had? <laughs> Communication, right? I'm going to say that first. It's another one of my seven barometers of resilience in my book. And uh, Warren Buffett, speaking of, he says that we can increase the value of our businesses by at least 50% by knowing how to communicate. And, I you agree know, without, with that. Yeah. right? Yeah. I know. And we have countless examples of how that failed. Right. I, I mean, my last business partner, you know, the, the partnerships that haven't worked out are always about communication. One of the key you know, mistakes I made was not having a communication plan uh, prior to the hurricane. And then communication became a huge problem without telecoms and Internet. And so, you know, it's having that plan, understanding communication, how to communicate with people, understanding that not everybody communicates like us. Right. So if you're communicating the same way with everyone, you're missing out on 75 percent of the population. They're not going to respond to you. And so one has to master that ability to communicate and also to communicate with others who communicate differently. And, you know, as Warren Buffett talks about it, it's not just speaking, but writing and, you know, communicating. We, we are all emailers and texters and, you know, so much gets lost in that. So mindful communication is really, really important. Well, I think the same thing happens in marriages, you know, or any kind of relationship. Yep. If the communication isn't there, that's where the problem starts. So, uh, absolutely, and I totally agree that uh, uh, a lot of people don't know how to communicate with other people. And for a long time in my previous life, I would teach all about the four different personality styles and the communication factors needed. And I could see where, um, for example, when I dealt with people like myself, we got along great, but that didn't mean anything got done <laughs> because right. you know, we all like to have a great time. And and yet <clears throat> when I, when I dealt with people who were very analytical and very um, decisive in how things had to go, I did not like them and I did not get along with them, but boy, are they necessary if you want to survive. So um, absolutely communication is so important. So, you talk a lot about, you know, the resilience factor and all of that. 
what is the most important leadership quality you found for not only yourself, but your clients as well? Well, you know, Rita Mae Brown says that uh, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. So (laughs) developing a sense of judgment from all the experiences and being able to make decisions and helping the people around us to know how we're going to make decisions for different circumstances, I think takes us a long way towards that ability to being a great leader. So people can understand what they can expect from you under circumstances. You know, do I have to have an autocratic style for this situation because it's an urgent thing, it's an emergency, and I need to make that decision? Am I going to delegate it? Am I going to let people weigh in? Is it going to be a democratic decision-making process? You know, all of these kinds of things. And, um, and then just being willing to make decisions and what factors can we consider? Who's been through this before that we can rely on where, you know, would somebody else be able to make a better decision from their vantage point? You know, what, we don't always have to be the one. And then if we're going to delegate that to someone, help them to have their own style for that. And so, you know, we have to start somewhere and making a decision is usually that, and then dealing with the consequences and knowing that, you know, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. (laughs) I was just going to say, there usually are always consequences that we don't count on and we're not always happy with all of them, but um, you know, that's called life. It's what we, it's what we go through and it's how we, we serve survive and do become the leaders. So what are some key ways that you say uh, to communicate as a senior leader to people who report to you who may be of a different generation? I mean, we are seeing that now where we have um, uh, millennials, boomers, Xers, um, and I don't even know what the new ones are called, but, uh, uh, you know, (laughs) you've got people from from 18 to 70 working together and, you You know, they, uh, of course, I go back to, I loved, I just absolutely loved the uh, movie with Robert De Niro, The Intern. I've watched that four times because I just get such a kickle out of it. I just like, and I thought, you know, everybody can learn from everybody. He had the wiseness and the calmness and the experience and they had the technology. But uh, what are some key ways that you talk about communicating with the different generations? So I like to pay attention, right? What, am, what are people saying in their own generations that they're wanting or needing? And, you know, I hired a lot of millennials in my last company. I, I had 160 people on my team and many of them were young. And one of the things that I read that was very pivotal to, to me to learn about them was they need to know the why. Right. And Simon Sinek started a movement with his book, the Start With Why. And I love that. And I open my workshops around my roadmap to success uh, around knowing your why and really understanding and developing a true visionary frame, framework that has as its foundation a core ideology that explains the values of who you are, the uncompromising values, the things that you will not sacrifice no matter what for the business. And the core purpose, which is the unreachable, you know, purpose for being that we can know if we know these things about ourselves, about our businesses, if the core group agrees on these things and we have a true core ideology, then we can enroll people who are aligned with that. And then people will kill for you. You know, I, I, my last company was in the entertainment industry and I've been in the entertainment industry for 25 years. And, um, you know, everybody loves, lots of us love movies and, and television and we want to be involved. And so we get the cream of the crop of every generation willing to be exploited to work in the industry, but it was a common passion. And, um, we got the best out of people for that. And that will be true. You know, social responsibility is a big, important um, value for people these days. And so making sure that you've got a social uh, component to what you're doing can be very important. So it's finding ways to connect with people of what's important to them and uncompromising to them and that matches Because you'll self-select out anyway if you've chosen the wrong people on your team. And it won't be a generational thing. It'll be a core value or a core purpose thing. Yeah, and you talked about, you know, uh, what is your why? And I have a friend of mine, uh, Steve Olsher, and he talks about what is your what? 
you know, so you really need to take a look and not get uh, swayed by the things that are dangled in front of you. And uh, it's interesting. I've, I've been listening to a uh, whole series uh, from Darren Hardy, and he is absolutely against multitasking, which I do a lot. And <laughs> he says, if you're not focused on one thing when you're doing it, it doesn't mean you can't have many things uh, that you can do, but at a time you do one, you're not going to be successful. So I'm I'm having a hard time with that because I am a multitasker. But, um, you know, I, I would certainly think that, um, gosh, you've got such a, a, a wide range of experience. I guess one of the questions our listeners might be thinking about, because I know I'm thinking about it, is you've been involved in so many different businesses. So how did that happen? <laughs> I wish I could say it was a plan, right? I had the plan, but, you know, I have gone for the experience. My One of my core values is the excitement of discovery, right? I love uh, blazing new frontiers and experiencing that excitement. So that's my life's promise to myself is I'm always going to be discovering. And so it's that form of adventure. I'm going to go try this. You know, I'll, I was in my college dorm one day. I was a kid, you know, 17 years old. And um, some guy said to me, I'm going off to the skydiving club. Uh, meeting, you know, and I thought I've always wanted to skydive in all of my 17 years. I'm going to go with him. And before you knew it, I was jumping out of an airplane, you know. And so it's just um, being able to grab the opportunities, right? And so that's kind of what's happened. I've gone after aligning with the people. So my ideal clients, when people ask, are very successful, you know, visionary, creative people who've achieved things in their past. You know, I can think of myself as a diamond cutter and a, a master diamond cutter is something that has not yet been rep replicated by machine. These are artists themselves and it takes a diamond to cut a diamond and to take a raw material, a stone and turn it into its shining brilliance. So I'm attracted to people that are diamonds and how can I help polish them up and make them achieve their brilliance and shine and their greatest light. And um, that's a very meticulous process that I consider my artistry and, and is, you know, found in the, the world of, of creating precious diamonds. And so, you know, it's, that is how I've ended up moving from experience to experience. And then when I've been an owner in a business, I've worked with clients who've been, in, asked me in, you know, given me some equity and a managerial role and, you know, I'm helping them get off the ground or expand into new ventures or um, scale into new um, revenue streams and products and services. So I'm there for a period and then we get it going and off the ground or we have an exit or, you know, whatever. It's a, it's a detailed plan at that stage. But, you know, I'm going after experiences and the quality of people that I want to be around. And I think that's the thing that we get to have as, a, as our right at a certain age where we don't have to work with just anybody, you know, those terrible bosses, probably all of us have had in our twenties when we, you know, we're doing things because we eat a paycheck or we need experience or we've got a, you know, it's too good to pass up. We don't have to do that anymore. So we get to choose who we, we are surrounded by. So what, what's in the future for Christine? I mean, what, what, uh, where do you see yourself in another 10, 15 years? Well, I hope that I will have started, grown, and expanded more business in that amount of time. I hope that I will have more books out and that I will be able to get my message out in the world even more fully and, and you know, tell my story because I think it's one that others can relate to and, you know, helping to make sure that no one goes it alone is my mission in life. And one way or, or other, whatever the endeavor is, is just not to go it alone. And so you that's know, what I hope to be spreading. That's so interesting, Christine, because I have to say, I love people. I mean, I love people. I love to be around people. But in my own way, I'm a loner. I mean, I I start things by myself. I grow them by myself. I, I uh, of course, I enlist, enlist people. But in reality, most of the stuff I do is by myself. And um, it didn't necessarily start out that way when my first business, as I grew it, because I ended up with seven offices, I had to have other people. So I kept hiring. But in the, in the speaking world, when I went on tour as a speaker for 21 years, I had an assistant. I had someone who ran my office. 
Um, and now in all the things that I'm doing, I contract with people. I have people who do technology. I have people that do uh, social media. I have people that do certain things. But in reality, I'm by myself. So, um, and I live alone except for my two cats. And um, I just, um, when you think about what you're building in terms of, of teams and businesses and so forth, it's something to really uh, have our listeners pay attention to because, you know, if something happens to you, just like you went through the hurricanes, uh, everything can be wiped away. But if you have a team and they're behind you and they're helping you run your business and they're helping you run your life as well, uh, there's a lot that that is saved there and that you can then pick up the pieces and accomplish even more. So uh, I think it's really uh, an interesting thing when we talk about, you know, those different areas, because uh, I can say it's 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 not an easy road by yourself, even though a lot of people um, pick that particular road. But I would say. Do any of your, well, let me let me say this, because first of all, I want everybody to know how to get in touch with you, because we only have five minutes left, believe it or not. Oh, and no. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to know where they can find you. I want you to, to know them to know if you have a gift for them. If you don't, that's fine, too. But if you want people to get a hold of your book, where they can find them, these things. So why don't you tell us the best way to reach you? Well, christineparakis.com. Is my oh, website you and fill that out for them. It's, uh... <laughs> oh yes, Christine C H R I S T I N E Paracus P as in Peter E R A K I S dot com Christine Paracus dot com, and um, all my links are on there to my books and to my business growth advisory system. And I have um, I do have a couple of gifts for your audience. I want to give them a strategic clarity questionnaire because this is my cornerstone piece. It is a simple document. It takes 20 minutes and it will give you some food for thought. I have done hundreds of these with my clients, prospective clients and listeners and audience members. And it is amazing what is revealed in this simple 13 questions that um, will help you make some decisions, gain some clarity and develop a street strategic roadmap for your own life. And so um, that strategic clarity questionnaire is available on my website and I will offer a complimentary hour session to go through those questions and really reveal the unique snowflake that is the individual that you all are. Oh, wow. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Listeners, you should really take advantage of that because if you've been struggling with who am I really and what should I be doing and is it too late and oh my, all these people tell me all these things, this strategic clarity questionnaire can be an eye opener for you and it will really get you started on the path that I think most of you would like to be on. So take advantage of that. And that's at her at, at her website, which is Christine Paracas, P-E-R-A-K-I-S dot com. Uh, so that's terrific. That's terrific. Uh, anything else that you would like to tell us in the time that we have left, Christine, that we have not touched upon? Well, I'm just going to say it again, Gail, because it's just so important don't go it alone. You know, we, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I too live alone. That's how I ended up conscious, unconsciously going home alone that night of the big hurricane. But there are things we can do, right? And I don't doubt for a second, Gail, that you have a community of friends that would have come and buried, taken, you know, pulled the, uh, the rubble away to find you, you know, and that's what we need, right? We need someone who's going to come for us in the storm and we can start by being that person for someone else. So even if you do have a solitary existence, you can put these pieces in place just to say to someone, you know, you're going through hard times. I've been there. Let me help you. Or just volunteering your services to your local community or saying, you know, reaching out to a neighbor that you didn't know before so that you're shoring up for these category five level events that you don't end up alone in a storm. Yeah, it's it's amazing to me that, uh, I mean, I, I was in the hospital a few months ago, and uh, of course, I didn't want anyone to come and see me because I was lying on a bed with all these tubes and things coming out of me. But um, 
everybody said, why didn't you call us? We would have come. I said, because I really didn't want you there, <laughs> you know, but uh, that's kind of how, how I am. But it was wonderful to know how many people said to me afterwards, uh, I wish you had called me. Uh, I, I would do anything for you. And I was very fortunate that my son, who lives across the country, you know, uh, in California, uh, he just sent groceries to me all the time. He had them delivered and uh, so forth and so on. So I was fortunate in that. But folks, you have a golden opportunity here with Christine. She is just a wealth of knowledge. Go to her website, see what she has to offer. She See if she's the person that could help you. Take her strategic clarity questionnaire. I'm gonna do it, because I think I need some clarity in the future, so I'm gonna do the same thing. And um, I just really think that you would be a great help to a lot of our listeners, Christine. So this has been absolutely delightful, and I wanna thank you so much for being with us today. And folks, by the way, you know, I'm gonna be running a retreat this year, and some of you SOBs out there, you spunky old broads who might want to go on a retreat with people like yourself and have me as your leader, I'd love to hear from you. And you can, of course, email me at gailcarson13 at gmail.com and let me know if you'd be interested in getting information on the retreat I'm going to be holding. So I look forward to that. And thank you so much, Christine, for being with us tonight. I had a wonderful time, Gail. I'm so excited that we got to have this time together. I hope your audience heard something of value and some takeaways from this conversation. You're an amazing person in the world, and thank God that you are out there delivering this message to your audiences. I'm so honored to be a part of your community.